Art is everything that the practical aspects of living are not, where the mechanics of living leave off, art begins. <laughs> Salvatore Dali was an internationally famous artist, and he was uh, he lived here in Monterey uh, for four or five years, I guess. So they got him to to uh, back this, this party, which was uh, called A Night in the Enchanted Forest. And I had been doing the parties for Old Sam Morse and Del Monte, so they had me work with uh, Dali, in, which I found very amusing. Dolly's concept was to change this huge ballroom into a, a forest glen. And to do it, he got uh, hundreds of uh, gunny sacks and filled them full of paper and started from this, the floor at one end uh, and went up to the ceiling at the other. So when it was all up, it looked like a rock grotto. And then they had blue lights turned on it to give a night effect. He had uh, managed to get uh, Oh, about a hundred mannequins from one of the stores, so all women's nude mannequins, and he had different heads, which he brought up from Hollywood, of uh, different animals, alligators, foxes, and everything on, on, the, on the nude figures. And down the middle of the, of, the, of the grotto, he had a huge bed, which was the table. And down the middle of the, of the bed, there were cages of wild animals, porcupines and so on. And Dolly and his wife in their pajamas were under the tablecloth. <laughs> Mr. Salvador Dali gives a party. The Spanish painter of surrealism dresses Mrs. Dali in a unicorn's head, just to start things off. As hostess, she presides from a red velvet bed. The party is a benefit for refugee artists, and costumes are supposed to represent the guest's bad dream. Artist Dali wears ear flaps, representing anatomy. A puzzled guest, Bob Hope, sees the fish course served in satin slippers. Presumably, the fish is sole. Soldier Jackie Coogan and the still baffled Mr. Hope see the main course. The party is surrealism, but them frogs is real. The County Road Mural Project was Bruce's idea. Um, Bruce and I work entirely different styles. You know, we don't, we don't, we're, just, we're just two different generations. We're just generations. But philosophically, we're very close. Uh, when Bruce asked me what I wanted to do for the mural, I said, gee, Bruce, I don't know. I, I sit on Canary Row. I have a studio then was right on Canary Row. I'm sitting across from the hotel. So uh, the Japanese company had just purchased the lease on the hotel, and I was thinking, I was thinking of that. And so my theme was Canary Row is a Japanese golf course. 
So I took, got aerial shots from my friend Pat Hathaway and, uh, and of the coastline and stuff and followed that very carefully and proceeded to make Henry Royal Japanese golf course. When the city came to pick up the mural, they were very upset because this major transaction had just occurred. There's lots of taxes involved and stuff. And they thought they'd be offending the Japanese to say this. So uh, Bruce and I sat down and said, okay, we'll throw, throw something on top of this. Some kind of, uh, you know, steamer basket or something like that. Kind of a style, so we did. So if you look closely underneath my mural, you'll see a Japanese golf course. Living the life of an artist is like uh, a health insurance policy in a way because it's a very benign passion. <laughs> when I applied to Cranbrook, I really didn't have... I had done ceramics for two years. I had found a piece of driftwood and I did brass coils and it was very abstract and that was one of the pieces I took to Cranbrook. Never believing in a world they'd accept me, you know, as a student, but they did, and that was one of them. And it was really quite exciting to be able to put together textures and forms and, and have somebody like that. <laughs> Artists are wonderful, you know, and, it, and a whole new world opens up. And so I finished up my BF, BFA and uh, did a degree in sculpture, and then I did one in textile so I could earn a living. And designed, I had my own studio, and designed and hand-woven um, fabrics, pillows, throws, upholstery, rugs, wall hangings, anything you could weave. You know, I did that for 20 years. I don't have to sell. You know, I'm in that nice position at this point. I only, the only thing about selling is it allows me to invest in more bronze. You know, I don't buy jewels and clothes, I buy bronze. <laughs> <laughs> Raw bronze. <laughs> Atkinson built this home here on this property and uh, uh, he brought me up here one day and this little platform was here, this cement, and it had been put in by the, the Navy surveyors to set their instruments on in charting the coast, I guess. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he said, we ought to put something on that platform, Gordon. And uh, so then he told me that he he would like to have something that <laughs> could serve as a memorial to the Pacific War. I had an old truck with a boom on it, a hand crank <laughs> boom, mm -hmm. an old, old Ford truck. And I made three trips to the quarry, brought one stone each time. And I remember coming up the Carmel Hill, I ran out of gas just before I got to the top. <laughs> and a, and a, a motor policeman, a motorcycle cop came by and he stopped and, and uh, see what the trouble was and said he'd send somebody up. We stood them up with the derrick, cranking the hand derrick. Mrs. Atkinson walked up. Uh, in the middle of the day to tell us that John Kennedy had been assassinated. And I've always had those two bound up in my mind together. Yeah.
I taught at Sunset School for 10 years, mm-hmm. and yeah. then middle school, Carmel Middle School in the Valley, mm-hmm. south of the Valley, mm-hmm. for 25 years. I've, I've been told many times by many students that uh, if it wasn't for this creative crafts class or the shop classes that they wouldn't, they don't want to come to school, they wouldn't want to attend school. You can reach children in that classroom in a way that you can't reach them in uh, an academic class. The thing with kids is a lot of them uh, had difficulty realizing that they could think of an idea and then carry it out. And when the kids found it, would find out, this is the, the beautiful part of teaching, you see the light go on. I like to carve directly, which means I just get a piece of stone. I love to carve stone. And so I just start carving the piece without any... You know, I work with molds and, and also work with uh, models and things like that. But it's, I don't know, I, I seem to get a lot of satisfaction out of just picking up a piece of stone and start carving on it. And I only keep in mind one thing, and that's the harmony of the forms that are emerging. Because carving or creativity to me is, is, is a happening. It just sort of happens. And if you just sort of listen and follow the feelings and what comes to your mind, uh, things will unfold right over time. You know, inspiration when it comes to work, uh, <laughs> that's a funny word because it's the work that creates the inspiration and in the use of it by people it's backwards you would think that people became inspired and they work but that isn't and uh, I've known lots of fellows say I have no inspiration I say for Christ's sakes work and the work creates the inspiration I graduated from Berkeley in 1927 oh no I stayed on and got an MA and 28, then I thought, oh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna have to make money. Oh, I went to, oh, I got uh, the opportunity to go to Europe and study for a year, so I studied over there with uh, Hans Hoffman in Munich and uh, Andre Lot in Paris. And that's where I, how I happened to work with Bufano. And Ben said, look, I have a, a commission to do a job and the, play, the thing to do is to come to Canyon sur mer and uh, I'll g- give you a job. But that's how I went down there uh, with Ben, and that's how I worked on making of this bull and some other things. The bull here, it, it's made of porphyry, and uh, porphyry uh, is what the Egyptians used. And you see these statues of the Egyptians with this high polish. Porphyry never loses its polish. And uh, Bufano's whole feeling in life uh, is immortality. And he never signed anything. He wouldn't have anything signed. As he is now. <clears throat> <He's> <clears throat> uh, society was going to have to recognize him once they saw him. Anybody who saw this thing here would say, gee, Bufano must have done that. And that's the way it is. I know how to create this thing a pictorial space. And painters who uh, can't see the pictorial space, my paintings to, to them are nothing. You see, because they're not, there's nothing that extraordinary about them, except to those who can really see in the... Uh, in space mm-hmm. and uh, so what is art <laughs> what a question <sighs> what's a tomato <laughs> i mean <laughs> um, what is love uh, you know there's no <laughs> it'd be preposterous for me to try and give an answer mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Hmm? What's an artist? An artist? Uh, I, uh, somebody who, when he was a kid growing up, he liked to make mud pies and then he liked to shape them into things and then he liked to draw a little, make little pictures and he grew up and he found out that 
This gave him more pleasure than anything else. So as he grew along, he made more pictures, and uh, then if he was lucky like I have been, society supported him in doing the thing he liked to do best. Both my mother and father were artists. My mother did commercial art, fashion drawings. My father did uh, Christmas cards. Even before uh, finishing high school, I got a leave to work in a, a puppet movie. I got a job at Disney's. That was about 1940. And I did uh, worked in the special effects and model department. I made a uh, puppet of uh, Pinocchio for the animators to study the, the movement of a string puppet. Uh, I made a uh, mannequin of Bambi for the uh, animators to, to pose. After that, I worked for George Powell Puppet Tunes doing stop motion puppets. Also at that time, I did the uh, mass for the ballet sequence of The King and I, and also the mass for the ballet sequence of Can-Can. Uh, Later on, I formed a, a company with Gene Warren and uh, Tim Barr, and we did special effects. The first one was Tom Thumb, uh, George Powell production. On behalf of all toys in Nursley, a most glorious welcome. Oh, thank you. Good morning, oh. Tom. Good morning, Tom. Good morning. Good morning, Tom. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I didn't know toys could talk. All oh, very grateful to you, Tom, to bring us to life. Grown-ups can't do that. They are too smart. And then a time machine. We did all the special effects. We, we built the uh, small model of the time machine, and we did the, uh, the progression of time and, and the, the growing of a, of a fruit tree. In Seven Faces, we did the uh, Loch Ness Monster and, and um, uh, all the different um, uh, things that Dr. Lau turned into. I've been asked by young people who wanted to get into special effects or to do artwork, and I have no um, formula for that. Um, 
My career has, has been, in a way, accidental. Young artists should start with uh, being able to, to, uh, to draw. And I feel that so many artists today don't really know how to draw. And that's like uh, someone wanting to be a musician and not uh, being able to read music. For me, uh, I like to, to do things that uh, bring out a feeling of or joy or love. Oh, I think the role of the artist is only to himself. I mean, he has to have a pact with himself uh, not to be a fraud, not to do a pretend feeling. And anyway, every artist, even if he is a, a portrait artist, has to lean on the intuitive inside of him because all art has to include the unseen, the inexpressible, mystery, because even a tree has a mystery in it. And unless art contains that gestalt that includes the mysterious, it's just a hack. I think when maybe I was about uh, 12 years old, I wanted a chemistry set for Christmas. So I got that, and that uh, almost uh, influenced me the rest of my life. Subsequently, when I got into the university, I majored in organic chemistry. Another man and I had a, uh, a private analytical laboratory. We were one of the few first environmental labs. We, we had a uh, long-time contract with the State Department of Water Resources to analyze water. So I was doing the art then more or less as a hobby. When you change a field like this from a scientific field where it's um, laws and rules and one right answer to art where everybody's right, uh, and there are no rules. You know, I, I guess I've made that transition a little bit. <laughs> the shed is just going to be a throwaway. I don't want this architectural subject over here to detract from that one. I'll have some trees up here. And we kind of space these out a little bit differently, um, put them off at different angles. Uh, I thought I'd put a couple of roses in real close as if we're kind of bringing this up. Uh, then we'll get some brickwork in here. The uh, charcoal is sort of grainy. And if you try to paint on top of that, then the, um, the paint sort of mixes in with it. So what I do then is to take most of that off. But now we can still see this drawing. I like to do what we call American Impressionism. And so you just get an impression, you, and, and you try to paint this impression. It's not too exact. Uh, you try to do the greatest amount of good with the least means. You cannot, therefore, over-intellectualize what you're doing. If you think too much, you can't do it. Paint the whole picture in color spots. Now, if you put these color spots down just the way you see them, or the way you feel them, and you put them down in the right value, which means the right dark and light, and you put them down in the right chroma, which means dull or bright, you will now get a picture that looks like it's in three dimensions, but it will be painterly because there's not a lot of detail there. I can look back at some pictures, I've, I've kept a few, um, and you look back at this and the picture might be five or ten years old. And you remember not only where this was painted, you remember who you were with. 
you even remember what you had for lunch. The, the experience is so indelible. You step back from something like that after having painted in a trance. You just go into an absolute trance on this thing, and you don't know where you are. People could talk to you. The traffic is going by. Uh, an airplane is going overhead or something. Somebody might be working close to you, or spectators might be looking over your shoulder. You don't see or feel anything, and you finish this thing, and you step back, drop the brush and step back. And um, somebody else might not think this is good, but you think it's good, and you say to yourself, who in the world painted this? Because you know you didn't. I was born in New Hope, Pennsylvania, which may be a familiar name by now, as one of America's first art colonies. My father was uh, one of the leading painters there, and in my opinion, one of the best, most original. And uh, his name was Robert Spencer. There were about six little girls who were the daughters of the leading artists, and I was the only one that was, wanted to be an artist. And so I would go around drawing and painting. And so when I was a little girl, my mother found a book of Granville, who was a French cartoonist of the early, middle of the 19th century, sort of during one of those revolutionary periods. I'd, I think it may have been 1848 or something. And he used to do people as animals. I was intrigued by it. I used to do these little funny drawings on the side and caricatures. And John Groth, who was the editor, art editor of Esquire, happened to see them. And he said, well, this is your forte. You really should be a caricaturist or do people. And so instead of just doing dull landscapes and dreary little still lifes and things, you know, I, I, he sent me to the Art Students League and I studied under Harry Sternberg. And he said, oh, you have a great sense of sarcasm. He wasn't the kind of artist you would imitate. He brought out what was in you. This is the pathos of people who have these pathetic goals and wanting to die with a grand funeral or something with a beautiful coffin like the one she's just passing. And she's just the charwoman, but she's dreaming of putting enough money aside to be buried decently. Raymond Burr bought a painting I did of wobbly dolls sitting at a traffic intersection, you know, and this theory was, um, I don't know the meaningless of metropolitan life, you know, and he bought it because he was sponsoring traffic safety. <laughs> but he bought a lot of them, and he bought so many it got me on Social Security. <laughs> So now I feel I'm a real American. I've got Social Security. <laughs> well, this was um, after the war, and I had moved from Connecticut to California, and I'd built a little house in Carmel, and I had a little extra uh, bedroom that I called my studio, and I was working as a freelance cartoonist for various markets in the East. <laughs> and. Um, one day, uh, Mrs. Ketchum burst into my studio, banged her fist on my drawing board, and hissed, your son is a menace, wheeled and went out and slammed the door. And I, holy smoke, what's gotten into that girl? Dennis, a menace? Boeing! <laughs> when those words collided, I thought, wow, you know, we, uh, we've got something there. Dennis the Menace uh, was a great name, and uh, I sent the samples off to my uh, agent in New York, and in those days he sent telegrams back, and he said, send us another week's work, it looks like we've got a buyer. Well, well it turned out to be Bob Hall, who, was, uh, who ran the Post Hall Syndicate, it was part of Dorothy Schiff's uh, New York Post at the time, and they were the only ones that saw it, the first one that saw it, and then they bought it. And uh, we started, released in January of 51 into 18 newspapers, many of them paying three and four dollars a week. 
which is hardly enough to carry the postage, except the New York, the uh, Chicago Tribune was the savior and said, all right, we'll take them for $100 a week. Wow, there was a dancing in the streets. And so he said, okay, we can go ahead and syndicate. The way I've been working over the years is with, with gag writers, but I've developed a file of ideas. So I'm never out of ideas. So when I'm ready to draw, I'll go to my file and pick out one of these gag slips and then uh, pull out a, a pad of tissue and a pencil and start doing some preliminary drawings using the, the idea as the basis. Now the idea might require some research. If it has elements in there I can't, I don't remember and I want to be sure it gets done properly. Then I'll go to my uh, morgue file and go into a classified search for, uh, in this case, a school bus. And uh, when I find what I want, then I'll take it back to the drawing board and use it as a, uh, as a reference point to put in the, the graphic that I want. Draw so well that people won't notice it. Now, what to me, like a cat is, is very difficult, and a bicycle is difficult. Uh, but so I take pains to research these things, so I'll draw it so well that the eye, the eye of the viewer goes right over, accepts what it is, and gets to the point. If these are funny looking cats or a strange bicycle, they'll stop and say, my, that's a strange bicycle, that's a funny looking cat, and they'll forget about the whole idea of why they're looking at the drawing, and then they'll say, well, I don't really get it, and leave, and never come back. So if you draw so well that there's immediate acceptance of what you have, and in that 10-second viewing, you, you're able to understand it and laugh, hopefully, and, and leave, then you've done the job. I think the public will support art, yes, definitely will. But I don't think it would start on a welfare line. Support should start with the artist himself. It's a great declaration of independence to be an artist because what you do is yours, whether it's writing or motion pictures or television or drawing or painting or designing, clothing, interior decorating, there are all kinds of outlets for an artist. And I think it's just a great occupation to follow. I remember when I first studied art, my teacher showed me a, uh, an ad in the classified of the uh, New York Times, and it said, um, sixth floor loft for rent, um, no elevator, no heat, no water, ideal for artists. 
I would say that art is a way of life. It's not a thing you make or a thing you do. It's just a way of life. It's a way of exercising your inherent creative impulse, which everybody has. It comes with the body. People have a desire to work with their hands. They have a desire to, to make things, whether it's painting, sculpture, or, or whatever. You take a child, hand them some clay, and you start to look up. You give them a piece of paper, a crayon, and start marking it up. An artist is a person who has a creative urge to send a message across of something that they feel and that they um, they must convey it and uh, it it reaches down into the being of that person. People are always wanting to define art. What's art? Expression of self. When you do something, that's the expression of you. I started uh, painting when I was very young. My dad was interested in drawing and <clears throat> and uh, I took art classes whenever I could in school. In fact, the only teacher's name that I remember are my art teachers. I uh, <clears throat> graduated from Oakland High in 1938 and I went to, to the College of Arts and Crafts for two years and decided I wanted to be a fashion illustrator. So I went to the Livingston School of Design in San Francisco. And um, then the war came along and I got married and my art career was put on hold until we moved here. So I was a late bloomer. We've always loved the peninsula, so we just decided to move here. <laughs> we found a little uh, a little house in uh, on Monteverde in Carmel for 135 a month. <laughs> oh, things have changed. We've done a lot of camping, and uh, we were with friends up around Bishop Twin Lakes, and a uh, friend of, that we were camping with. We decided to go up in the snow we up there and have lunch, so we left early in the morning and hiked up and did have our lunch in the snow. Got back about five o'clock and we didn't see one other soul. But do you know, in my head, I've done hundreds of pictures from that hike. Like we'd come upon waterfalls and then we'd make a turn and there'd be a big cliff and I could see an abstract design in that cliff. And the whole thing was just, it's in my mind, and I've done paintings from that one day. In painting, uh, what counts is this thing of feeling? And it is not what the mind thinks about it. It's what, what the creature feels about it. You have to kill the critic in order to be an artist. The critic in yourself, you see because the critic in yourself will always keep you from being original. The critic in yourself will always pass judgment because you'll always want to be a Van Gogh or a Picasso, you see, and you'll always fall short. Mm -hmm. So the only way to keep your courage up, in a sense, is to banish the critical side of yourself and to say, whatever I do, so long as it comes from something genuine inside myself, is worth looking at. When I was a very small child, I don't know why, I wanted to be an architect. And I remember for my eighth birthday, I asked for a drawing board, plastic triangles, an architectural scale, and a T-square. And uh, I was so proud of myself because I sat down and I figured out all by myself a system of drawing with a horizon and two points. And if you drew the lines this way, you could draw a picture of a building the way the eye actually sees it. And I, uh, I was quite proud of myself later on when I found out that someplace back in the 12th or 13th century, somebody had already discovered this, and it was called perspective drawing. But nobody ever showed it to me. I found it out on my own. By the time I was in junior high, I, uh, I remember a fracas with my 
art teacher who really liked me. I knew that I was sort of a favorite, and maybe others did. And, but um, she wanted us to, to draw, to learn to draw perspective, and to, and, uh, you know, with the lines going to receding uh, focal points, and perspective points, and she wanted me to do it with a ruler. And I wouldn't do it with a ruler. And that was a bad example for the rest of the class. So she came and took the ruler and pulled my hand back like tightly like that and spanked my hand. And I was already, I mean, I was too old to get a spank. <laughs> and I was so mortified. <laughs> but I didn't do it. So when I got to Chicago, I was in the Art Institute and I was with paint people who'd been interested in painting all their lives. They'd been going on Saturday school for children mm -hmm. and then for high school people. Uh, so I, I liked it. At the Art Institute at that time, the janitor force was like being uh, in the elite club of the school. Mm -hmm. uh, it was, you know, if you, oh, you're in the janitor force. Oh, yeah, we're in the janitor force. We serious artists. We. <laughs> When I finished the four years that they called for the, for the diploma, my old teacher uh, said, uh, so you, you're coming back next year? He, he never wanted to lose his students he'd like. That was a big compliment. He wanted me to stay. And because he went eight years to the academy in somewhere, St. Petersburg. So uh, you're coming back? No, no, I don't think so. Well. He says, so, you've been painter now, huh? <laughs> now you're a painter, huh? <laughs> One of my grandmothers was a, a painter, a very bohemian, my mother's mother. So my mother understood painters and kind of protected me from criticism and things like that. Well, my father was a businessman. He wanted me to marry a financially secure person. Of course, I never liked those type of men. Victor was in the Second World War, and I was in the Marine Corps. So after the war, we uh, took the VI bill, and, and we're going to take some art classes. And uh, we met in art, class, art school. I was very lucky to have made a, an Italian, because they're so respectful of the arts, and they put a value on what we were doing. And it really saved me. I like to surprise myself. I mean, I like to just start painting and wonder what's going to happen now. But I didn't used to be that way. You know, I used to have everything worked out, boring. You know, when you get older, you want to amuse yourself or, or do something different and not be so self-conscious. And then, after you painted for years, you get that way, I think. school in second grade or so or third grade I'd be drawing horses and uh, teacher get mad at me and send me in the cloakroom and I'd have all the sheets of paper in the cloakroom all glued together and painting a whole herd of horses and uh, she finally said Jack you've got something going for you I'll just let you stay in the cloakroom from now on <laughs> that was the start of my art career summer vacation in California, including the Tehachapi country, where I worked in the famous uh, Tejon Cattle Company and the Crofton Cattle Company, and, and uh, I got my uh, spurs, so to speak, of riding good horses and, and learning the cowboy trade. I had a wonderful opportunity to ride with vaqueros that are all dead and gone, but are now written up as the most famous of your California vaqueros. Old Frank Martinez was a cowboy that I rode with. He rode a Barleno Mustang, which is, they're all completely gone now. <clears throat> if I was a cross between an Andalusian horse and a uh, wild horse, a California wild horse, and they had heart and stamina that you'll never believe. He would ride from the Tehachapi's across the desert 
to cross the Sierra Madres to Pasadena, put his horse in a barn there, get on a streetcar, go all the way down to Los Angeles to see his girlfriend, come back the next day, pick up his horse, ride all the way back, and it was 90 miles each way. My art is to record a life that uh, is fast disappearing and it, do it very accurately. I want people to see my work and know that this is the way it really was and that uh, the best compliment I can have would be some old timers. Those guys ride just like we used to ride. on the faculty of Otis. I liked it down, I mean, I liked the teaching job and the, the aura of the art school and the students, and it was a nice life. So I had the idea of um, teaching the same quality of art somewhere else. And I had been up here many times doing workshops and being invited to talk and do this and that. So I thought, well, I'll go up there, because my daughter lives here besides. I wanted to, I thought that was a good idea. So I approached the museum, and they said yes. George de Groot, uh, bless his soul, uh, was one of my uh, good friends. He came over and every day for years, and we talked about art and and the whole rest of the world, but mostly in, in a kidding fashion, you know, unless I really wanted some information, and then he had it for me. But most of the time, we just kind of made fun of each other, you know. He would walk in and see a painting of mine, and he'd say, I don't think you need that seagull. You know, there's 50 seagulls, and he, I don't think you need that seagull in there. One day, George said to me, you know, I've got to teach this color theory, and I've only got one day. He said, I, 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 don't, I can't work it all in there. What will I do? And I said, leave out red. Oh, God, you should have seen him. He couldn't stop <laughs> falling on the floor. <laughs> he, and he told the students that he was just a, leave out red. <laughs> I was the kid in grammar school who got asked to draw the elephant on the blackboard. My father thought a man should work for a living and not play around with fancy stuff like painting China. In fact, that was the reason that I spoke of the brief career in the Army, because he was so opposed to the idea of me going to an art school. I didn't know him. I'll show them there's nothing funny about me, so I signed up. I joined underage and did the three-year hitch in the cavalry. I knew nothing about horses and had never seen one before except a milk train horse. But they taught me, and as I got to know more about it and began to get a couple of more months of age on me, I began to like it. horse cavalry regiments that we had in the United States. Uh, it had once been the elite of the whole army. Oh, it was real John Wayne and Earl Plinish. Well, yeah, I loved it. Being at the age I was, I thought it was just terrific. Had no sense of reality. It was very glamorous, but it was kind of useful, useless against panzer divisions, as the Poles found out in 1939. I thought it was neat that we caught on by 1941. I qualify as an expert with a saber in the 20th century, but I did. Well, the artist that serves the state obviously has to stop exploring and has to, has to paint ideas. They um, excommunicated art, real art, in Germany in favor of what Hitler wanted for propaganda purposes. And so he came up with what amounted to calendar art. 
lots of pictures of Hitler in armor on a horse with a spear to show them what a heroic figure their Fuhrer was. And so the artist is bent to fit the ideas of the state. And he's no longer free. If he's not free, he can't produce anything of significance. And that's why, in a sense, the artist is a threat to a, uh, uh, to a dictator, because a dictator wants to freeze what he has as power. And the artist has to break free of that freeze, so that by nature they're in conflict. We were the guardians of the southern gate of Point Lobos. They never sent a warden over there. It was us, because we could see everybody that went down our private stairway to that beach. So I said to the head warden, very nice man, I said, now look, I, I like to do some photography in the caves on the south shore. And I said, sometimes there's a low tide, say 5 a.m. or 6. So what about it? He said, any time. So I could go in there morning, noon, or night. Mother was so ill that I could not, in all conscience, carry on painting in a studio that required my daylight hours of attention. I had a nurse in the house, wonderful Norwegian woman. So I wasn't worried about mother. But then when I got home, I, I took charge, you see, and I had the rest of the day. And unlike a painting, you don't have to fool around with a photograph much. I decided to show these, and I had the temerity to ask Ansel to come, which he did, along with a number of other people, and I had some good food. <laughs> and, yeah. It's astonishing how uh, relevant they are considering the passage of time. I have gone through many, many periods in my life and I've tried everything. I, I tried um, different philosophies, different systems, different health regimes. Uh, the mystical, the psychic, the, the uh, conventional, I've tried it all and it's all been good. Uh, also, I feel that in a way, when I look through 50 years of my work now, I see one continuous painting. It's almost as if uh, all my life I have worked on one painting and I never got it right. And to the extent that uh, a painting always falls short of what exists in my mind about it, while I'm working on one thing, I'm already uh, beginning to create the next one to improve the shortcomings. And of course, there's no such thing as perfection in art, you know? Everything is, is a uh, stab at trying to externalize something that is interior. <laughs>